I first wanted to congratulate you on your induction to the Rock Gods Hall of Fame. When did you first find out about that honor? Sometime, <laughs> sometime just a few couple months back. Like, I didn't honestly have any idea what it was. Um, I didn't. I wasn't really aware of it. And then, uh, I, my buddy um, Rob Jacobs, who was inducted last year, called me up and said, "Hey, you know, you got." Uh, your name got put up and they've inducted you in. And I said, well, okay, that's cool. Tell me about it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's kind of a trip. Well, was this and, your uh, first uh, Hall of Fame induction honor? Uh, into this, you mean? In general. I, I mean, some people luck out where their high school inducts them or their city or their town does. But other people just never get that Hall of Fame honor. Hey, I'm an unlikely candidate, bro. I'm. I picked what I do, but because I, I'm, I choose, uh, you know, the uh, the humility and um, invisibility side. So, <laughs> you know, to actually have someone, you know, acknowledge me amongst um, people who I, uh, you know, a whole bunch of these guys are guys that I. Uh, so yes, the answer is yes. This is the first one, um, and. Uh, I don't know how many others there'll be. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm laughing. It's just kind of, you know, I, I, I do what I do because I don't do it for this, if that makes sense. Right. Well, you do also have the uh, distinction in that while you produced and or engineered a lot of top albums, you started off yourself as a singer-songwriter back in your New York days. When was it that you kind of put the singer-songwriter path into the background and became more of a studio guy? Well, what happened was I, you know, I was in the, I was in New York and I was um, was playing in bands and you know writing music and and uh, aspiring, you know, to uh, to have a, a a life playing music. Um, and I was fortunate to be surrounded by some incredible talent. First off, my my mother, um, her best friend, our family friend's best friend, um, you know, who's not longer with us, Pete Seeger, the folk singer. So I was surrounded by Pete Seeger, Arlo Guthrie, Dave Van Ronk, um, you know, that whole world of folk music. And then um, as far as like myself, I was playing in bands, some of my better friends um and i played with bands like rat race choir who uh one of the guys in that band was a guy named bob mayo who went on to play with peter frampton and you know he played on peter's big hits in the 70s and he was the foil like the keyboard foil um for peter and so you know i my whole focus was to be surrounding myself with people better than myself and i had an epiphany as a teenager that i was not going to if I wanted to be and be around the best musicians in the world, I wasn't going to be, uh, it wasn't going to be as a player. Um, and, um, I think that epiphany truly served me. I don't know where it came from. You know, sometimes they call things like that. God shots. You get a God shot. You don't know when or where it's going to happen. Sure. But I got a, I got a God shot at a very young age in my teens. And, uh, I pulled what we call geographic where I moved 3000 miles away. Um, part of it was I felt the need to get out of New York cause I was getting into a lot of trouble. Um, I was kind of a punk. Um, I wasn't um, an ignorant punk. So I was wise enough to know what I was doing, which I needed to stop. Got out to California and I was fortunate enough to find my way pretty quickly into a couple of different scenes. One was, uh, in LA, um, which was what we called the Mellow Mafia, and I became a guitar tech. Um, at the same time, I was still going up and living in the Bay Area and um, was part of the punk scene up there because I'm a punk. I'm kind of a punk at heart. And the music that I came out of New York was punk. I was way into punk, um, besides every single other style of music. So I was fortunate enough to latch on to working with um, some of the guys, actually, that are being inducted, like Jim Keltner, the drummer. I was his drum tech with Ry Cooter. Um, I worked with David Lindley, and so Bob Glob, who's being inducted with the bass player, with Jackson Brown and David Lindley. Um, and this was way before um, Danny Karchmar was in, in Jackson Brown's band. Um, he's being inducted. 
And so I was a guitar tech, um, Ry Cooter, Jackson Brown, David Lindley, Poco, Fleetwood Mac, um, you know, um, Brett Tuggles being inducted, but he didn't play with Fleetwood Mac back then. He was a keyboard player, but he went on, you know, later to play with Fleetwood Mac and David Roth. So a bunch of these guys, um, and then inclusive of Danny Korchmar, who I went on to when I became an engineer, engineered records with Richie Zito was incredibly influential for me. He got me out of a studio I was working in and introduced me to Giorgio Moroder. I became Richie's engineer and Giorgio's engineer. So it's kind of kooky. I'm looking at all the names of people who had, I look up to J.R. Robinson engineered a ton of records with him as a drummer. Um, so, you know, I kind of feel like, uh, you know, it's kind of weird. I go, wow, how am I in there? You know, these, these are guys that I've been following, you know, like been, you know, been a big part of my, my life, you know, as older guys that are a bit older than me, you know. Well, your credits, I think, speak for themselves. And before I ask you a little bit about that, when you find out that people are from New York City in their bios, usually you find out they're actually from Queens or from Long Island. Where are you originally from? I was born in the city. Uh, I, we lived in Queens. Uh, for the first few years. Then uh, my dad, who was an artist um, and a uh, um, illustrator, he was uh, also a teacher. He started the School of Visual Arts, Bern Hogarth. And so Bern, um, my dad, um, you know, taught school in the city. So I lived in the city. And then um, my uh, my um, parents got divorced. My mother moved to Yonkers. Um, and my dad moved out of the city to Pleasantville. And I ended up getting bounced back and forth between the two of them for, um, but at that point in time, all my friends were in the city. So I got kind of bounced between Yonkers and Pleasantville and I was just bored, pardon me, shitless, um, in Pleasantville and, uh, kept just ended up in the city. And, um, and that's when I got out of, you know, I graduated high school and got out of there. So, um, so kind of pretty much the city with a little taste of uh, Yonkers and Westchester. A lot of the people that you've mentioned before have a Van Halen connection like yourself, a lot of the other inductees. And you worked on the Different Kind of Truth album. It was one of the best reunion albums that anyone could have ever hoped for for a classic rock band. Was it a pleasure to make or was it difficult to make? Um, uh, kind of a loaded question, but I have an amazingly beautiful relationship with Ed Allen Wolf, the Van Halen. Um, I love Ed like a brother and Al, and I love Wolfie, you know, Wolf. I don't call him Wolfie anymore. That's not, you know, he's a man now. <laughs> sure. I love those guys. And I still, to this day, maintain a very close relationship. Ed and I text and we're in touch constantly. Um, and I'm, you know, it's a deep relationship um, formed with trust and there's a bond. And, you know, Ed and Al, they're like it's a wolf pack, you know, with wolf included. Um, pardon, pardon the pun on that. But uh, they, everybody wants something from them or not. And so when someone comes along that, you know, for myself, I have worked with a lot of different people over the years. And you learn to, um, you know, that if you have a secondary agenda, It'll get found out real quick. I honestly do not have one photograph of myself with Ed or Al. That's one of the deals. I, I just have never gone, hey, can I get a photo? You know what I mean? And that's with a long relationship. So that part of the, re the recording was amazing. Now, David Lee Roth, not so much, you know? I mean, <laughs> I mean what can I say? Um, it's not, it wasn't like there's any, you know, I mean, I just find him a very difficult person to deal with, you know, and uh, I think I'm not the only one, you know, I think narcissism is an interesting thing. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not the easiest thing to be around. And uh, I have a lot of respect for his intellect. I think he's absolutely brilliant. Um, but the making of this record had more to do with Wolf and the chemistry between him and his dad and his uncle. And the fact that if they really didn't need a singer, 
they probably would have not done it with Dave, you know, I'll just say. But they wanted to go back and, you know, create that Van Halen original with, you know, Wolf in the band because what father wouldn't want to make a record with his son, you know, who's an amazing musician. Wolf is an incredible talent. He sings his butt off, plays incredible drummer, bass player, guitar player, intellect, musically, and the history of Van Halen lives in him underneath his fingernails. So Wolf had a huge part in making that record and inspiring his dad to want to, you know, make music. Um, a lot has been documented about what things I just don't even need to get into. You know, Ed has had his past with, you know, drugs and alcohol and he's and, and his cancer and he's in a great place, you know. And what a great thing for me to be able to shepherd the record through the and the winding path uh, and across the finish line, you know. So it was an honor and a lot of it a pleasure. And there were definitely some tough times. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I'm to this day, I'm proud of, you know, the fact that I pulled it across the finish line, the first record um, with David Lee Roth since, you know, the 80s. And the first one for them, you know, I think at the time was like 16 years or something. Is that right? 17 years or something. That sounds so, about right. Yeah. So there's something to be said for, for you know, finishing something, completion. You know what I mean? Right. I really appreciate that that honest answer. Another interesting thing about your your discography is that you've worked both on albums by Harry Shearer and Derek Smalls. How does it compare working with the two of them in the studio? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's funny yeah well the the harry Shearer record that was really that was a fun one that was a long time ago um and uh yeah i mixed that one um there's some funny songs on that man he's so brilliant and yeah Derek smalls i mean come on what a bass player <laughs> uh that's funny yeah i mean harry is just he's amazing hilarious and uh his uh his producer um partner cj vanston is one of my dearest friends incredibly talented um you know he was the uh, musical director um you know from spinal tap onward all those movies you know if you look mighty wind and all that stuff so cj's great you know this is that's the beauty of this i mean what is, i call it an embarrassment of riches and that's just that's in a positive way, you know, I mean, it's a, a wealth and abundance of riches that I get to be surrounded by, um, inclusive of, you know, some of the people you're mentioning. So <laughs> Harry or Derek is great. Yeah, it's great. Well, induction um, aside, though, what is coming up for you? Are you allowed to say anything about upcoming projects or is it really just week by week? You're in the studio and you take uh, it one week at a time. No, I'm in the middle. Um, well, I'm, I'm doing a few things at the same time. Um, one is an ongoing project. Um, actually, as you know, today is the 21st of October. On the 23rd of October, two years ago, I lost my oldest brother, Michael, to, um, to cancer. Um, and then shortly after that, I was asked um, by Edgar Winter um, to um, partner with him to co-produce, engineer, and mix a record honoring his brother Johnny who had died in uh, July of 14 he actually died on the 16th which is one of my brother's uh, other brother's birthdays anyway um Johnny had died on the you know in 2014 my brother died in 17 and you know it was a couple of years after Johnny had died Edgar was considering doing a tribute to his brother and um most people don't really know the story of those two guys together, but, you know, Johnny pulled Edgar out of Beaumont where they grew up and brought him with him. Edgar's a musical genius. And I don't use that word lightly. Edgar plays every instrument and plays them all well, besides singing his butt off. Um, most people think of him as a keyboard player um, with the guitar doing Frankenstein, but he also played all the, almost all the instruments on that record, drums and timbales. And so anyway, um, you know, and he played at Woodstock with his brother and he talks about that. 
we started at the beginning of this year um, producing together a record to tr- a tribute to his brother. And on it, we have like a bucket list of people already recorded and a bucket list of people to be recorded. There's right now 17 songs and we're barely halfway through, you know, tracking. Um, we've got, you know, the, the people just off the top of my head, Billy Gibbons, Warren Haynes, Joe Bonamassa, Joe Walsh, uh, Bobby Rush, Buddy Guy, Derek Trucks, uh, um, uh, Larry Carlton, Kenny Wayne Shepard, um, Ringo played drums on something. Um, we're working on Gary Clark and Derek uh, um, uh, Doyle Jr. And I mean, the list keeps going. You know, people who um, I've been in touch with Frampton, who may or may not be able to have the time to do it because he's, you know, um, winding up his finale tour and also, um, I don't know, you know, he's struggling with his hand or whatever's going on. Right. Um, but, you know, bucket list of people on this record that we are lining up that we've already done. So, yeah, but, um, yeah, it's going to be really fun. And that's an ongoing thing till we get it done. I can't really even say when it's going to be done. Well, it'll be done when it's done. And then that'll be um, I'll mix that at that point. And as we speak, I'm producing a uh, Texas uh, Americana artist that I've made a few records with over the last 30 years, a guy named James McMurtry, whose uh, dad is uh, Larry McMurtry of Lonesome Dove, HUD, um, you know, um, Last Picture Show, Terms of Endearment. So his dad wrote those um, books that were turned into movies. And uh, so James tells those stories. His first couple of records we made with John Mellencamp's band in Indiana when John helped him get his record deal back in the late 80s. So um, I've made a few records with James and I'm in the process of that record. I've got um, Texas guitar player David Grissom and Charlie Sexton. And uh, there'll be some other guests on that. And uh, James writes really great songs. So that one um, is in the works. And then I'm just finished mixing 50 year reunion of Poco with Richie Fure, um, Timmy Schmidt, um, live at the Troubadour, where we re recorded the whole Deliverin record from top to bottom, and then a second set of Poco slash Sutter Hillman Fury slash Buffalo Springfield songs. So I've just finished that. It'll be a DVD and a double record. And that, I just finished mixing that a few weeks ago. So. Yeah, just try to stay busy. Trying and succeeding. So I guess in closing, Ross, any last words for the kids? Um, stay humble. Keep passionate. Um, have some balance in your life. You know, um, time becomes meaningless in the face of creativity. So t- sometimes we find ourselves not eating and not sleeping and then things get weird. So I tend to have learned that you got to keep balance in this, in our musical you know, endeavors that there's, if you have some balance in life, I think you can have longevity. That's one of, I think the keys to my world is I found a woman early on, been married 33 years, um, have a family and tend to try to stay out of trouble. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, on a daily basis, the only two things I can keep uh, in my wheelhouse are my attitude and my actions. I try to keep a good attitude and and uh, try to, as they say, don't make your mother cry. So, 